Hello, welcome again to Pluralsight Spotlight. I'm your host for this episode, Adam Gunn. If you're new to the series, let me set the table for what you're gonna learn over the next 20 minutes. Our Spotlight series is a chance to meet some of the incredible people that make the Pluralsight brand awesome. We'll dive into their personal backstory and hopefully share some fun experiences and insights that will make you just a little bit better in whatever you're doing. I'm super excited for today's Spotlight guest. He's been programming professionally for over 30 years and accordingly has done everything from build computer games to programming safety routines for nuclear reactors. If you haven't fallen in love with the diluted Scottish accent, I'm sure you will by the end of this episode. It's my pleasure to welcome to the spotlight, Simon Allardyce. Thanks, Adam. Delighted to be here. It's exciting to have you, Simon. I'm, uh, I've been a big fan. You and I met probably eight years ago. Yep. Yep, and it know. is that Scottish accent that I, <laughs> that I love. I've tried um, to tone it down a wee bit, you is know. Is Arizona finally rubbing off it's, on you Yeah, after bit? 20 plus years in the States, it's kind of mellowed. It's somewhere in the mid-Atlantic now. This series is about diving into backstories. So I'd love to start there with you. Like, what put you on a technology path? How did we end up here? So it's it's kind of, as you said earlier, I've been programming for a long time, actually since the, the mid-80s, so it's getting closer to 40 years than 30. And the thing is, is for most of that, I had no desire to do anything with education. You know, you know there's, some, there's some kids you meet at school that always want to be a teacher when they grow up. That was never my plan. And, and I was very much kind of an introverted kid. I, the idea of being in front of people, never a desire. But I always liked good training. I liked anyone who could actually explain things in a way that made you go, oh. And because I never had a desire to, to educate, at one point I got the opportunity to give a user group presentation. And I thought I was going to be terrible at it because there was nothing about me that was an educator. So I worked very hard on doing that once and did it. And it went over well. And people asked me to do more. And the thing happens is when you kind of have that background in technology and you can actually talk like a human being about it, people will ask you to do that. So then it kind of gradually became more and more teaching and less and less actual programming. I like to keep my hand in it a little bit, but that's kind of the transition. So I started very much as a software developer, not as an educator. Cool. I notice as I look at your personal library, you have kind of a leaning towards foundational topics and foundational right. curriculum. Is there a reason why you've gravitated there? Again, it's kind of almost accidental, meaning I first did fairly geeky subjects, lots of, of programming stuff. And when I did that, I wanted to get more advanced. Partly, I think that's kind of an ego thing. It's the, let me show you how much I know about stuff. Um, but again, it turned out to be that when I did introductory content, when I really spent time on trying to be someone's best first 30 minutes on something, whether that was blockchain or SharePoint or AI, when I did that, it connected with people and I, and I just got a whole bunch of requests of, hey, can you do exactly that same thing, but do it on automation? Or can you do that and do it on machine learning? Um, so in a sense, I wasn't dumb enough to kind of go, no, I'm just going to go down the path of just super advanced stuff. It's like, no, people, people like what I do here. I seem to be good at it. It kind of still surprises me, but I'll go down that path. I'm not going to kind of ignore the signals from the universe. Yeah. One of the first Simon Allardyce courses I watched was your, what is programming right. course. And I mean, that's as basic as it gets, but it does have this approachability to it that we can tell is intentional on your part. Um, is there something in that foundational realm that you feel is more critical than anything as someone starting that path? I, I think the, the big thing that you should be going for as a teacher at that level, particularly is, is empathy with the learner, thinking about the kind of the pain that they're in and the confusion that they have trying to remember, all the things that you sucked at when you first got started with that and point them out and actually bring people through it because there's there's still a lot of technical education where I'm going to say the bar is fairly low where people think that to explain something just means I'm going to tell you what to click 
And they don't actually explain what this means and they don't actually say anything about it. So the real benefit in that kind of early content is you get that opportunity to go, okay, hang on a second. Can, let me just explain something. Let me, give, let me give you context about this. I mean, I've lost track of the amount of new programmers who you kind of realize have, have no idea how many lines of code they're supposed to write. Today. And, and they kind of go into this thinking programming is like typing that you just, you learn to do this and you must type thousands and thousands of lines every single day. And somebody needs to actually point out, this doesn't happen. You don't do this. This is about thinking. It's not about typing. But there's so many introductions to programming that would never tell you that. So it's trying to think about things like that. What are those little bits of secret curriculum that nobody actually points out and try to point them out? Because when it's in beginning content, that's when you actually get people saying, Oh, I, I get it. That that's what that means. Or now I understand that context. Or selfishly and egotistically, doing introductory content well is the kind of thing that gets feedback like you changed my life because I, I'm now in this career because of you because you actually explained it to me. So yeah. I love that. I love that. And recently, you've added creative director over curriculum at Plural Site to your title. What, what does that mean? How are we expanding the goodness of, of Simon? Yeah, and that's, that's kind of been a long time coming. Essentially what happened, you know, I did, for a long time I did courses like, I would say, most other technical training, which was screen capture for the most part, narration, somebody talking over recording of a screen. And I would start doing these little moments of live video. And the benefit was not, ego. It seriously isn't. I am not such an egotist that I think you just want to look at my face all the time. I'm really not. I'm really not. <laughs> but the what I thought was those moments where you're actually trying to maybe give someone a warning about someone to kind of say, hey, here's a common problem. Rather than do that over the screen capture, it's the moments that you want to be able to turn to the person and say, okay, you might be tempted to do this thing. And if you do it, it's going to break. Here's why. And then you go back to it. But it's having those moments and identifying that for things like warnings, for just that conversational idea, you should have live video. And I did find that people responded when, when it was filmed well and when it was lit well. And when it was, so it started to become two camera shoots and then sliders and then intentional B-roll and starting to add all of this stuff. And the more I did that, the more people said, this is great. I want more of that content. The problem had been that a lot of authors started saying, I would like to do that. And I, I had to basically say, well, it took me about six or seven years to get to this point. Now let me see if I can make your journey a little bit quicker. So I'm in now in the position here as creative director where for some of the content that we do, it kind of all goes through me where I, I get to do that. We work with other authors, but we all kind of get to work on up in the production values, more high quality work, multiple camera shoots, more B-roll, just making much more engaging content because it just, it just makes it easier for people to keep watching. It's more enjoyable. And if they do that, then they're going to learn more. I love that. Like as a steward of the brand, like I think it truly differentiates our, our product. There's some in the industry that might criticize Pluralsight that that extra burden maybe makes it a little bit harder for us to get content to market. Right. Um, maybe we're not the first, maybe our libraries aren't the, the biggest. Like what would your commentary be to those individuals? And, and there is, there's a point to that. I'm not gonna pretend that if you want to do these high production values, you can then instantly get it out in 30 minutes. But I do think that a lot of people are, are more interested in something explained well presented well. Sure, you don't want to be like, what was it, the old O'Reilly days when they were famous that they would take so long to do a book that, you know, the book on one version of Windows would come out the day the new version was released. <laughs> yeah. So sure, there's still that compromise of quality versus speed, but our audience, we know, responds quality. They're willing to wait a little bit to get that kind of that high end stuff. And, you know, it's a big thing for me as trying to work on this process, making it quicker, making it easier, making it simpler, but still the, the output, the work has to be good. Love it. Yeah. Maybe circling back to your personal journey, cause you didn't start your 
on the Pluralsight platform. Like, I'm curious why you chose to partner with Pluralsight and why you've stayed here. Yeah, I, I, you know, I started off doing, and I did instructor-led training for a while, the kind of classic corporate classroom stuff, which I think is, is useful, not as a video trainer, it's not useful to have that background from the sense of it's not about managing a classroom here. It's not about projecting to the back row. You don't need to do that stuff. But when you teach in person, after a while, you get to develop that kind of sense of, I know when people are about to kind of give me a puzzled look and raise their hands yeah. on somewhere, and it's somewhere I need to go, okay, now there's a thought that you might be having around here. So it was very worthwhile for me to do that. Having said that, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm quite happy not to do classroom stuff. So I started doing, I think my first video course was in 2000 um, and was released on VHS, if you believe <laughs> that one, and then CDs. And that was with lynda.com before they kind of got uh, bought out by LinkedIn. And there I was a bit of kind of an odd duck, which was I was the kind of token geek in a company that was very much about design and, you know, it was about Photoshop and about web design and, and fireworks and flash. But it was a really interesting place for me to work for a while. But um, I kind of became, had been aware of Pluralsight. In fact, before Pluralsight started uh, doing video courses online, I actually attended one of Aaron and Fritz's first uh, actual presentations in 2003, so 20 years ago in, in Redmond when they were teaching in person. That's all they were doing. So that's, that's the first time I met them. And we'd kind of been in touch a couple of times over the year and been aware of each other. So at one point, Aaron asked me you know, to come out and see what Pluralsight was doing. I came out and it seemed like a, just a perfect fit, you know, a very, very tech-focused company with just a whole bunch of great content I could get into. So that was eight years ago. This is now the longest place I have worked in my life in nearly a 40 year career of being here. And I'm here because of the people. I'm here because the, the team that I work with is fantastic. And I'm here because I get to make the content I want to make. And, and that's the secret. That's Love what it. keeps me here. Yeah. I wanted to talk about um, a new project you've been working on probably for the last year. Um, Pluralsight's recently built a, a new solution specifically tailored for helping organizations tackle what we call tech fluency. Right. And for the sake of the audience, they may not know what tech fluency is. So give us a little peek behind the curtain on what we're solving and why and why we think it's such an exciting thing. Yeah, so tech fluency, and we kind of admit that there's no perfect word for this idea. Some people will call it uh, tech literacy. I don't particularly like that term because to just be literate, you know, suggest kind of that simplistic level of knowledge. To be fluent suggests a, a lot more comfort, a lot more willingness to engage in a conversation. If you're fluent, even at that low level, you know, you'll you'll have the conversation, you'll order the meal, you'll order the ticket, you'll buy that train trip. Now, the idea is that we kind of notice there's been a shift in the audience over the last few years. You know, if, if I go back four or five years, when I was presenting to a company about cloud or about AI or any technical topic, I would expect that the room and the audience will be software developers, data scientists, IT pros, technical people in technical roles. And what kind of quietly happened over a few years was we'd be asked to give those talks, but the request would come with, oh, can you make sure this works for a mixed audience because we're going to have the project managers in there. And then we're going to have the C-level people. And then we have these folks that don't necessarily want to do this for a living, but they need to know about it. I mean, that's really the key. When you said five years ago, who at the company needs to know about cloud or AI or machine learning, the answer was, that's our technical people. Now, when you say, who needs to know about cloud? It's everyone. Everyone needs to know about cloud. Everyone needs to know about AI. Everybody needs to know about this. So there was that it's kind of less about changing the content and more about changing the audience. So the tech fluency is about that being aware that this audience isn't necessarily going to be writing machine learning algorithms. They're not going to be writing distributed blockchain apps, but they need to know what these things are, even if it's just so they can 
have a conversation about it. They can sit in a meeting about it. They can, they can kind of identify the problems that these things solve. And it turns out that for most people, that doesn't take that long. If you want to learn a little bit about AI, you want to learn a little bit about machine learning, you don't need to spend a year doing this. You can actually get some pretty good stuff done in 30 or 40 minutes, but you just need someone who's going to explain it well. And that's what we try and do is we try and have kind of your perfect 30 or 40 minute introduction to AI, blockchain, automation, cloud, all these topics that are the most important things in technology right now. Yes, it's going to change, but we really focus on having kind of this core set of 12 technology areas that we think are generally applicable to organizations of any size. Yeah. I'm, I'm living proof of the, the need and value for that. I'm a senior leader in a non-technical role, but oftentimes I'm advocating and fighting for resources or budget to go and build the things that will, you know, move the brand. And just this week I was in, you know, fighting for prioritization and getting resources from a data team and from an architecture team. And if you don't understand, have a base knowledge of what Snowflake is and what Snowflake does and how the developers want to use Node.js versus React, like I, I, I admit sometimes I'm uncomfortable with that technical conversation, but if that shows up in the meeting, it might cost me the opportunity to win the resources that I need. And so that, that competency is becoming more critical than ever. And, right. and I'm seeing that in my role here. And, and yeah, I think the more that gap can be closed, um, the better. Yeah. So you're building something like, how is this all coming together? What's the solution? Yeah, so we've called it Tech Foundations is our kind of name for this program. And that in itself is the, the different approach to this. Quite typically what we've done at Pluralsight is we provide access to the library. It's, you know, it's thousands of courses, it's hundreds of different paths. And for, you know, some learning goals, that's exactly what you want. Not for this. If, if what you're trying to do is push the the general tech fluency at an organization where you want to be able to do this kind of on a, on a wide level across departments and divisions, even entire organizations, you need something that's very clear, very straightforward, that is not some open-ended, endless piece of content with thousands of courses, and lots of choices to make. So it becomes, here's the 12 courses you can do. They're matched up with assessments. It's really easy. You go to this site. If you have a license for this, it's one click. Everything's visible. You know exactly what you're supposed to do. You can take these topics in any order. So we, we made the content to be complementary but not sequential. So if someone goes to that page and goes, oh, blockchain, I've been meaning to learn about that, then hop in. So we want to have enough constraints that it's obvious what to do and enough flexibility that the learner still has some agency, they have some choice. So the, the whole thing is very intentional. The actual program is intentional. The pieces of content are, it's, you know, it, it's a fully custom solution. It's custom content, custom assessments, custom functionality, all designed for this problem. And we're, we're really proud of what we've done here. And the modules are how long in length on average? Generally, they're about 30 to 40 minutes. There's a couple that I think maybe hit 42, but that's about it. And it's, it's really that idea of something that you could take, you know, in a lunch break at your desk while you're having a sandwich, you could watch this course. And again, we kind of engineer them for these light bulb moments. We want people who are going, oh, that's what that means. That's why that's important. You know, and, and to your earlier comment, I meet so many people that they spend so much energy kind of trying to massage their appearance in meetings and, and make it seem like they know more than they do. And, you know, they're really worried about creating this kind of facade around themselves. And then I've had these emails where people go, I've kind of, I've faked it for years and spent so much energy and then you just explained it to me in 25 minutes. It would have been much easier if I'd just done that in the first place. It's like, yeah, because a lot of this kind of conversational level is not hard to get to. And that's really what we're aiming for. Understand the terms, understand the most important pieces of jargon and the basic ideas that will allow you to go, I would have that conversation. I would join that meeting that I wouldn't have joined before. Yeah, I've, I've been using the analogy on my project that I'm, I'm kind of like, planning a bank robbery. I'm not really, but my job is to 
create a crew, right? Like, and if right. I don't know the crew that I need to create, then the project won't get over the line. And so okay. I have to be fluent enough to understand the roles that I need to be right. successful. And that's that's the only, I'm not trying to be uh, the developer, the engineer, right. the architect, but I need to understand the role they play in the broader project and who I need to bring in at the base I, level. I, I like that analogy. I may steal it. At yeah, some point. If welcome. you see it pop up in a course in about <laughs> six months, that you're may welcome. happen. You're welcome to use it. Um, I've seen some stuff on social media. You're dabbling in chat GPT. I am, yeah. Everyone wants to talk about it right now. I'd be curious what successful applications have you stumbled into? What advice or words of warning would you give, you know, the audience here as you're, we're all learning this together fundamentally. Sure. I mean, I, I like to be, you know, always wary of hype. You know, when things are presented as the, the next big thing, you know, we've seen so many of these kind of go by the wayside. Um, that doesn't seem, I don't think that's true here. I mean, chat GPT is changing things and all the associated technology. I mean, who knows? Five years from now, we may, oh, do you remember ChatGPT? It may be taken over by something else. But this application of generative AI, ChatGPT, and, you know, Google Bard now released. We have all these other technologies. We have the, the generative images. We, you know, Midjourney just hit version five. We have Dali. We have Runway that just released for, for video. I mean, it's incredibly interesting. It's very easy to be kind of pessimistic and worried about AI because it's easy to hit that. Is it going to take my job? Is it going to destroy everything? But I think there is still, there's reason for pessimism. There's a lot of reason for optimism. It's very exciting stuff. The idea of using these tools as a, I mean, the, the cliche is as a co-pilot. I mean, people are trying to use that term again and again, but it's a good analogy of this is not meant to replace you. This is meant to be kind of your exoskeleton. I found ChatGPT a lot of fun to deal with. It's a great thing for sparking ideas. It's a great thing for generating um, bits of content. It's also, you know, the, the term that OpenAI uses that it hallucinates. And I think that's a, a, a wonderful term for when ChatGPT just kind of goes off on its own thing of just inventing stuff. And it's, it's weird because it does such a great job of this. I mean, I did this short video about a, an example of it faking a book that doesn't exist. And then when I asked it for references, faking all the references. But the other day I was demonstrating it to someone and I asked ChatGPT, oh, write a informal blog post about the metaverse and how AI is being used and talk about the current hardware. And it generated some a pretty decent result. And it talked about the Dreamverse XR 2023. And I looked at this and thought, I mean, I'm I'm pretty up to date with what's happening in the metaverse. I'm like, that's not a thing. But it actually got me worried. I think, well, hang on, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> maybe it is a thing. And I actually had to go and Google it to go, is the Dreamverse 2023 an actual piece of hardware? Because ChatGPT was so convincing on this that I now doubted my own knowledge of this area. And it's like, okay, that's kind of scary. I love the idea that OpenAI are, are promising that as this gets better, there will be fewer hallucinations. I mean, that's their actual written goal for GPT-4, fewer hallucinations. And it is that kind of strange dream world of what it can generate. And, you know, some people kind of think, well, we'll, we'll be past that in six months. It's like, no, because the nature of these things is, is still, they don't really understand what is true and what is not. So there is for a long time going to be vitally important that we take that role. And it's that whole idea of how can you use this? How can you make it help your current job or even go into a new one? The only thing that I don't think any tech person should be doing right now is I'm not even going to touch that. Yeah. It's like, no, you should be touching it. You should be hands on right now with it because it's not going away. Yeah. There's an efficiency quotient that's real. Similar to your story. I recently asked it to write. I got asked to speak and I was supposed to submit a bio. I forgot. So I said, hey, write a quick bio for the SVP of brand at Pluralsight. It made up some fascinating <laughs> former companies that I worked for. Right. But in the end, I could quickly go in and fact check my own bio. And it was like, right. it got me 80% of the way. And right. I think it's that efficiency in machine learning that really is at the core. Absolutely. Um, because that 
saved me 30 minutes of time probably than starting mm -hmm. from spot zero. Absolutely. And it's not even just the, in a sense, the time saving. It's also, we have a tool that can kind of remove a speed bump. We can have a tool that actually makes it easier to just get started on something when you just kind of default this idea of, okay, I've got a blank page staring at me, but I could maybe just ask the question, hey, chat GPT, can you just give me a few ideas about this and use it to, to spark some of that movement? That can be incredibly valuable. Which is again, efficiency, which, I, which I, I love. Yeah. Um, back to that efficiency, we've been talking to authors through these conversations around making time, finding time to learn. Right. Organizations, we're challenged right now economic challenges, pace to market challenges, like not every organization is prioritizing learning time within their organizational cultures. And then even individuals we've surveyed are saying that, you know, finding time to learn is the number one barrier. Um, advice, commentary, thoughts on that perspective? It is, yeah, I mean, it's it's something we see. It's something I feel even personally. I mean, it's something I'm, I mean, I'm in my, mid fifties. Now it is not as easy for me to pick up something new and, and, and understand it maybe as quickly as I might've done when I was in my twenties, but I still have to do it. I mean, my job is to learn new things and explain them to people. So I have to get more efficient as well. So it's not necessarily that I expect to carve out four or five hours a day on anything anymore. It doesn't happen. So partly that's kind of some of the reason why with tech foundations, we make this stuff as short as we possibly can. We really focus on information density and how we can make this kind of entertaining to watch, enjoyable, as well as containing a lot of information. From my own perspective, you know, it's kind of curating lists of, you know, what are the newsletters that I'm going to read every morning? I don't listen to a lot of podcasts um, personally because it, there's kind of that level of, I, this is 47 minutes for this, but they don't actually get to the point for 20. I can't do that. It's like, I want something that's going to get going very quickly. Um, so it is kind of trying to identify those things that you have least resistance to. I know I can read, say, the TLDR newsletters in AI and crypto every morning and, and at least not be too out of touch with some of the things I might have otherwise missed. I try to identify, you know, some of the authors that I like reading, some of the other video folks. For me, it's actually quite difficult with the job I'm in to watch other video authors because I'm so used to everything needs to be critiqued and reorganized and how would I edit this and how would I do that? So it's quite difficult to actually get to the content. Um, I do think it's still a, a wonderful medium. You know, so I like to find certain, you know, whether it's, tech YouTubers to watch, whether it's that kind of very compact information dense content to at least kind of make it easy to keep up to date on stuff. Beyond that, one of the things that I've done for several years and I still do now is when I try and take notes, I use a, a space repetition application that I, I wouldn't say I review every single morning, but I think I probably hit five out of seven. So I kind of just bring certain things on back onto my radar that I'm to be aware of. Because I know if I don't do that, it's very easy for me to, to forget something. Oh, I know I was reading about that six months ago, but uh, I can't remember. So spaced repetition apps, a kind of a small but hopefully curated list of, of say, email newsletters. If you like listening to podcasts, by all means, do it and kind of identify YouTubers or other authors that you kind of think are trustable and can you you can rely on them to make good stuff. Random question, but music plays a role in your creative process right. to some degree. Explain the role of music. I think I mean there's it, it seems to be quite a big crossover of of computer folks and and musicians. You know, when I was younger, I played guitar these days I like to play piano and mess around with synthesizers, stuff like that. Um, partly it's, it feels like a kind of adjacent geeky technology that's just nice to dive into that's not something I ever expect to get paid for. In the past, I wrote a few soundtracks for computer games. That was something I thought I wanted to do as a career till I experienced the reality of the job and then thought, 
oh no, I'd rather I'd rather stay in tech than doing this. This because the the realities of dealing with you know games that I didn't really want to play and dealing with you know other creative ideas that I wasn't necessarily connecting with um, meant that the reality of the job was not what I wanted. Yeah. Um, so I I am a happy amateur with music, and I just like. I like messing around with sound. I like messing around with the technology. Well, Simon, I really appreciate you joining us. We end these with just a little bit of randomness. Okay. Um, my social teams prep me with some off-the-wall questions, get to know you a little bit better. Um, it's been fun to hear the different perspectives on these. So if you're game, we'll just hit Let's a few of these quick, quick response questions. If you could switch legs with any animal, which one would it be? Um, I'd probably go with like some kind of gazelle because right now I've had like really bad sciatica for the last four months. And actually something that's just uh, light and quite happily trot up the hills and down the hills, I would go with that. Yeah, aging is, is rough. <laughs> I'm feeling that too. Uh, Favorite pizza topping? I'm a bluff old traditionalist. It's, it's a classic Neapolitan margarita for me. So some tomato sauce, mozzarella and basil and a little bit of olive oil. Love it. What did you want to be when you were a kid? Astronaut. Nonfiction or fiction? Fiction. What are you reading right now? I'm reading uh, Tomorrow, Tomorrow, and Tomorrow, and I'm completely spacing on the name of the author. Okay, so. we can put that in the notes. Okay. Do you have a dream vacation destination? I was recently in the, uh, the UAE. I spent New Year in Dubai, and I was just there for a week and would have quite happily stayed there for a month. I would love to go back. I, so that kind of whole um, Arabian Gulf area, so Qatar, Oman, Dubai, that's currently top of the list right now. Uh, team cat or team dog? Team dog. And I don't, I've never had a dog, but I'm a dog person. I have a Sony Ibo. So that's because I travel so much, we can't really keep a dog, but I have a robotic dog. That's the best I can do. If Simon had a superpower, what would it be and why? The instant thing that came back to mind is I would love to be like the Superman of sleep right now. If I could actually reliably sleep for like eight hours a night, that would feel like a superpower. I love that. Yeah, it'd be life changing. And finally, if you were a flavor of ice cream, what would it be? The, the thing that comes to mind is rum raisin, which is one that everybody kind of hates as a kid, but kind of strangely gets more and more into when they grow up and go, I, I used to hate that flavor. So I th I'd like to think of myself as an acquired taste. So I'm rum and raisin. <laughs> I love that. Well, Simon, thanks so much for joining us on this episode of The Spotlight. It's been a great conversation. Really appreciate you taking some time out of your busy day. It, it's been a pleasure, Adam. Thanks very much. Thanks. And to our audience, I want to thank you for joining us today. We'll put links to some of Simon's courses and anything else we referenced in this episode in the show notes. And we look forward to you joining us on the next episode of Portal Site Spotlight.